the very obvious thing is that people have the right to care. And in a system that is based on ability to pay rather than the right to care, uh, then a lot of people go without care. I think people have the capacities to uh, see through the deceit in which they're ensnared, but they got to make the effort. Welcome to Propaganda, where we firmly but politely challenge corporate power in Canada. Now, we've got a public health care system in this country, which means that in theory, all Canadians have the right to free and quality health care. However, there's always been a small group of people pushing for the privatization and commodification of health care services and infrastructure. Today, I speak to two prominent Canadian academics, researchers, advocates, and experts in Canadian public health care policy. In our conversation, we discuss some of the ways that this privatization is occurring. Pat Armstrong is a distinguished research professor in sociology at York University and a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. Hugh Armstrong is a professor emeritus of social work, political economy, and sociology at Carleton University. Here's the interview. How would you characterize what the average Canadian kind of perceives as our, our, how our public health care system is doing right now. The polls indicate that as far as it goes, Canadian health care is um, very popular. Uh, and in fact, even conservative politicians who would like to privatize it uh, don't take it on directly. It's the third rail for people like Harper and Ford. So every jurisdiction has an activist group and what I think is interesting is that COVID has brought a lot more people in, I think, and certainly more younger people. There's no question that, uh, that it's, these organizations has, have been uh, top heavy in terms of older people. <laughs> but now there are quite a few younger people uh, involved and, and so heavily involved. And this is, uh in a sense paradoxical because the uh, place where uh, Canadian Medicare uh, has been failing the most is in nursing homes where old people live. And yet they're, uh, often their grandchildren are appalled at what they see there. Uh, a second thing I would say is that the, uh, um, the failures of Medicare have particularly hit marginalized groups. Our earlier work was a comparison between Canada and the United States, but our most recent work for the last 10 years, we've had an international project, but it's been focused on long-term care. Mm -hmm. So uh, in Norway, Sweden, uh, Germany, the UK, the US and Canada. So in through that research, what are some of the findings that you found um, with regards to some of the things, some of the best practices that um, Canadian practitioners as well as long-term care residences could kind of learn from those other, um, those other systems. Let me start by saying we don't use the term best practice. Okay. Best practices are by definition decontextualized and, and we devote a lot of attention to context. So what works in Germany may not work in the United States. What works in Britain may not work in Norway, et cetera. So we're looking for promising practices and I'll turn it over to Pat to tell you what some of them are. <laughs> well, one of the reasons to look at long-term care is that it is the most neglected area, especially in this country and in North America, um, it, less so in Germany and Norway and Sweden for sure. And certainly one of the very important things we've learned is staffing levels, how important staffing levels are. Although I suppose to some extent we do that before we started. But what, what we would say is the biggest takeaway is that the conditions of work are the conditions of care. And that's true whatever part of the system you're talking about. And if, if people are going to get decent care, 
then we have to have decent working conditions for those who provide the care. And there's been a lot of talk recently about person-centered care, or patient-centered care, or, and, and it could be argued that some parts of the system have been physician-centered or more, more centered on the person delivering it. But in terms of, especially the women who provide the bulk of the care throughout the system, that uh, if we don't give them decent conditions, then they can't do the work. They can't provide the care. This means a number of things. It means obviously the, that the workers should be paid decently so that you can recruit enough of them and so that they'll stay. But, but pay isn't enough. The conditions have to be uh, that they have enough workers so that they're not run off their feet, uh, that they have some time in the long-term care case in particular to spend chatting with the residents, getting to know them, uh, getting to know uh, their body language as well as their uh, verbal language. They may not have verbal language. Uh, uh, being able to um, become friends, in a sense, with the, with the workers. And, and this is particularly true when 60 to 80 percent of them are cognitively impaired. But, it, but it's true wherever you're working. They need the time to provide the care, the skills that they need to provide the care. And uh, again, it's most obvious in long-term care, but it's true wherever uh, you are talking about in the healthcare system. And they need some autonomy to apply the skills that they have learned to provide. Well, management systems in our current climate are about just enough of anything. <laughs> Uh, barely enough, and that uh, that of course the the old argument about how do you make a profit? You make a profit by paying less or or selling more. And in terms of uh, of care for the elderly, we do both. But it when it comes to to areas that have primarily public funding in Canada, then they can't sell so much more. But they can uh, they can reduce the staffing, for instance, level, so they're paying less. And it's not just the numbers; it's also the skills involved. In fact, Ontario and some other provinces are seeking to introduce a category of worker that gets trained in 15 hours on a computer, um, because they say there are too many people in the, being laid off retail and hospitality and so on. So we'll we'll. Uh, uh, plug the dike uh, in long-term care by bringing these folks in, uh, but they, they're not what's needed. Um, if you are going to help someone to eat or to toilet uh, or to dress, um, you, you need some skills, skills that we found out about in, in some detail when we went into homes in the six countries Pat mentioned. Uh I think that there is the very obvious thing is that people have the right to care. And in a system that is based on ability to pay rather than the right to care, uh, then a lot of people go without care and or with very bad care. Uh, so that's one reason. But another reason is that it's more efficient <laughs> to cover everybody with decent health care. It's more efficient in terms of the labor force. I, one of the forces that led to the Canadian health care system, the public part of it, doctors and hospitals, was the discovery before, uh, as they were recruiting for the Second World War, of how badly people's health, how bad the health was of the people they were trying to recruit, uh, indicating the need for better care. And so your society can't function, even if that's all you care about is the economy. What good is it to have all, a lot of people who are sick or who, who can't survive? But when Emmett Hall uh, headed the Royal Commission and was looking at health care, he didn't go into it thinking public care would be the best. But when he looked at all the evidence, he saw that it made the most sense, not just in terms of the right to care, but in terms of efficiency. Mind you, he said you should cover everything. <laughs> Dental care, long-term care, home care, the whole range because then people would be at the appropriate level for care. We said, we'll start with doctors and hospitals, but we never went any farther in terms of a federal plan at least. Right. So the, uh, the public, I think, wants uh, free care, uh, you know, free at the point of care. 
what some of the privatizers say, well, it doesn't matter who owns it or who operates it, as long as you get it for free. I think the uh, COVID-19 experience has been huge cracks in the system in terms of quality uh, in particular, and that uh, now increasingly Canadians understand that it has to be operated as a public system, or at least a not-for-profit system, rather than a for-profit system. And it's really clear that we need a much better integrated system a much smoother transitions amongst various services, a, a better way of coordinating long-term care so we don't have so many people dying and don't have a, a, you know, aren't missing a labor force. Well, you can't do that. Uh, you can't do it in a province of Ontario. 58% of your uh, homes are owned by for-profit uh, companies, most of them corporations, that have a primary responsibility to stakeholders. That's, that's how it works. Shareholders. Yeah. <laughs> to shareholders, I mean, yeah. sorry, not stakeholders. Um, but uh, so if you want a, a coordinated system, a smooth transition amongst these services, it's pretty hard to get them when you have all of these different people making the decisions or organizations making the decisions that don't have to do with putting you first. And, and to add to that, you mentioned contracting out. Uh, it's important within a facility that there's teamwork, that people are, have the same employer, that they get to know each other, et cetera. If you contract out the food or the cleaning or the laundry uh, or even some of the nursing uh, through an agency or, uh, the or the management increasingly, you lose that uh, as well as having profits drained off from money that should be spent on care. And I, I guess it's part of this, this ideology that healthcare should be a commodity to be bought and sold on a market, right? And I feel like this is kind of something that's, and as, as, I forget which one of you said this earlier, but no politician's gonna campaign on privatizing healthcare. So it kind of comes in these pernicious ways, right? I know there's the, the P3s, right? The public private partnerships, which is a way to, you know, siphon out money, the taxpayer's money into the private sector to build hospitals and healthcare infrastructure that's gonna, it's, it, it's, it's ultimately not gonna come to benefit the public. What they do is they privatize by stealth. Right. They don't do it directly. Yeah. But they do it as best they can. And now we and others are, of course, uh, fighting them, resisting them as strenuously as we can. But when they contract out, uh, when they say the hospital, okay, it's, it's free at the point of service, but the hospital now doesn't mean as much. It's going to be defined more and more narrowly. Right. Uh, and so it's, there's uh, long-term care and there's home care and there's, um, of course, um, your drugs, as soon as you leave the hospital, you have to start paying for it, and on and on and on. So they, they don't do it directly, they do it indirectly through privatization by stealth. Mm -hmm. Well, and to continue on in the contracting out, in the Romano report, uh, his federal commission, uh, he assumed that you could contract out things that he called ancillary services, like food and uh, cleaning. It's a total failure to recognize that these are integral components of healthcare. They're not only a team, as he was saying before, a team that's very important, but in, when you're in the hospital, but especially when you're in a long-term care home, the most important event of the day is, is mealtime. Uh, and, and of course, food is critical to your health. And when a contracted out company brings in a whole plate of food that was made up, who knows how long ago, how and, far away. And, and, re, and how far away and reheated, many of the residents look at this and, and they're no longer hungry. There's no smell to the food, it's not attractive. We ate the food in every home we were in, and half the time we couldn't tell what it was we were eating. Yeah. The idea of the new public management. So I find it very interesting, the idea that kind of this, this class of mid-level man managers from the private sector have kind of come into healthcare, and there's kind of this obsession with statistics and numbers and deliverables, and, and it's... To me, I find it interesting how some of the most important things in human life are not able to be captured by these numbers. We've done some writing on this too. Yeah. Uh, 
it's not that the workers who are actually doing the work uh, don't care about these numbers. They actively resent these numbers. They resent it because these numbers take workers away from providing care to sitting at computers. Uh, they resent it because the workers who sit at the computers tend to be registered nurses, occasionally social workers or physiotherapists, and um, they're not providing care. Instead, they're, pro they're producing some numbers, and the numbers don't reflect, especially in nursing home, what's needed, because they're all medical. Uh, in fact, uh, Kaihai has tried to generate some social engagement numbers uh, indices based on the RIA MDS, and they haven't been able to do so because RIA MDS asks 300 odd questions every quarter, but uh, they're all about important things. So at least a lot of them are, like whether you fall and whether you have a, 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 an ulcer. Uh, but they don't address whether there's any joy, whether there's any fun, whether there's any social contact. So those numbers are particularly bad. And we know that the managers say, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. And they want to manage. Uh, but a lot of things are not readily measured. New COVID management isn't so new anymore. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. It, was, it was kind of last year's or 10, oh, ten years ten ago, years ago. The flavor of the month, but it's still being talked about for sure and, and practiced. One of the things we like to say is accountability gets reduced to counting and the only thing that counts is what can be counted and and part of what uh, what he was talking about you can't count joy <laughs> and and you can't you can't count for instance what a difference it makes to an individual if the, the healthcare worker sits down and holds their hand Years ago, when AIDS was first becoming an issue, we interviewed a nurse who said, the most important thing I did for the AIDS uh, patient that I was dealing with was to sit and hold his hand while he was having a bath. Well, you know, how do you put that? Not only do you not put that in that scorecard that you're talking about, it it's a, would be negative in your scorecard because you wasted all this time when you could have been uh, you know, giving medicine to 14 other people and uh, putting someone on the toilet. I mean, the other thing is uh, the, the reduction, the efficiency defined as a in terms of tasks rather than in terms of relationships, which we would argue is the case with care, but in terms of time tasked. And uh, the best illustration I heard of this was and the pay equity case I was involved in, and the chief nursing officer said, they're, they're saying that you can bathe uh, a patient in 10 minutes. And she said, the only way I could do that was to throw him in a chair, hose him down and let him drip dry. Maybe in Guantanamo. Yeah. 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 And of course the effort to uh, uh, do this fast means often that the worker uh, who's supposed to be working um, with another worker, the wor worker alone tries to lift the patient onto the toilet, perhaps even onto the uh, into the bath, and so you get soft tissue injuries. and And uh, that work is among the most dangerous work there is in the in the whole labor force, because of all the injuries. So you, you guys have been this in this battle for a little while now. Can you talk a little bit about some of the victories that you've seen? Um, and maybe some, and kind of a big question, but maybe some of the lessons learned that you could pass to the next generations of people who want to make sure that our healthcare system stays in public hands. Well, the Cambry case that has just been heard in BC, uh, which was a result of a physician and some of his friends uh, and some foreign aid. <laughs> taking on the Canadian healthcare system and trying to argue that there should be uh, room for private payment and um, more private patient. And he lost, and he lost, uh, at least so far, they'll appeal it to the Supreme Court, but uh, they, they lost pretty clearly. And it, that was as a result of not just the lawyers on the case, 
but of whole communities coming together and providing the evidence and demonstrating why public payment for public practice makes a lot more sense. So that's a, a big victory, which we hope will be finalized when it goes to the Supreme Court or when the Supreme Court decides not to hear it. Uh, let me mention a small one. Because of the women's movement, we now have publicly funded midwifery in most parts of Canada. It's not great. It's not as, as thoroughgoing as it should be, but it, <laughs> it's not great in terms of the coverage, not the midwives. <laughs> no, <laughs> midwives are fine. The coverage isn't, isn't as good as it could be. Uh, but uh, it is now publicly funded. Uh, and uh, you know, we made a small advance there. Another small advance is that after decades, the current Ontario government has committed itself to four hours of direct care per resident per day in nursing homes. They haven't delivered yet, but they have at least now committed themselves to it. Uh, and they were backed up in that commitment by the uh, 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 commission on long-term care that, that the Ford government appointed a few months ago. It, it issued an interim report saying, yes, let's go for that right now. It'll take a few years to make it happen because you've got to train a bunch of nurses and RNs and RPNs and PSWs. It can't happen tomorrow. You can't just sweep up people off the street. On the other hand, uh, there is that commitment and it is backed by not only unions, but also communities, uh, the health coalition, for instance, communities, and the family councils uh, for all the, the long-term uh, homes. It's, it, there is a lot of popular support for it, which means that even the Ford government is now um, stepping gingerly in that direction. We got to keep the pressure on though. Right. And we, uh, we won the right to some services, like uh, abortion. Um, abortion. Under, uh, in terms of uh, coverage in healthcare services, I think. And th there's also the case of other uh, victories that don't seem to be directly about healthcare, but have an important impact on healthcare, like pay equity. Uh, the pay equity settlements did extend to a lot of people who worked in healthcare, like union organizing. Um, has made a huge difference to uh, nurses, for example, or uh, uh, hospital employees in general. So uh, that they don't all look like healthcare victories, but they they certainly have an impact on healthcare and on improving healthcare. It should also be said that most workers in long-term care in most provinces are unionized. That's an advantage of working in the same location as Karl Marx said 140 years ago or so. Uh, but in home care, it's less likely because right. it is such a fragmenting activity. This is not to say we shouldn't have home care. We should. Uh, we should have more of it. But we should have it with unions. And the unions are trying to get in there. They are in in some places, but not. they don't have the union density that they have in long-term care and in hospital. But to the extent that you, you contract out some services, for instance, the, the, the housekeeping service, the firm that, that is providing that may, may or may not be unionized. I was wondering if, you, if, if either of you had anything to say about why folks who care about public health care should keep an eye on international trade agreements. Well, the first round of trade agreements the Canadian healthcare system was described as an unopened oyster in terms of uh, availability for profit making. So <laughs> we have to be constantly vigilant. And once it gets privatized under because of the free trade agreements, it's really hard to bring it back into the public sector. And we should call them international investment agreements, not trade agreements, because they aren't really about trade. They're about the protection of property. And in the case of healthcare, in particular, the, the uh, protection of pharmaceutical uh, property, uh, their, their patent system. And as we know, that got worse and worse as the time went on. Uh, I think 
in the, uh, as I understand it, in the Trans-Pacific thing, we, we got a slightly better deal than we did before, but it's still a major problem. Well, and you also have uh, the uh, issues around foreign ownership. They, the government agreed to let uh, a Chinese company buy a whole lot of homes in Vancouver and uh, they're going bankrupt, <laughs> which is a major issue after they had terrible reports on the, on the care that was being provided. And obviously it was seen as an investment uh, inclu especially in terms of the land. This is, uh, you know, because these are basically real estate companies often that, that want the land and the building as opposed to uh, the mm -hmm. providing care. Yeah. And Linda McQuaig in particular has been writing about this in terms of what's going on now with vaccines and what happened uh, whenever it was 20 odd years ago with Connaught Labs. Uh, we don't have the capacity because we have neoliberalism and its new public management manifestation. Uh, and uh, the government is, federal government is now timidly trying to get some manufacturing capacity back to Canada. But the fact that we're not at the front of the line is because we don't uh, manufacture. And of course, the countries that do are going to disproportionately favor their own. But yes, well, we have seen during COVID. Um, what happens when you're so dependent on world trade connection, but also on, to go back to the new public management, just in time production. Right. You, know, you don't believe in stockpiles. You don't believe in surge capacity. You don't believe in, um, in, in any, extra, any flexibility in the system and it's coming crashing down, right? Now. The supplies that were in public hands after SARS uh, their shelf life was over, they were disposed of, they were not replaced by government. It's a constant struggle, there's no question. And as he was saying earlier, so much of the undermining is done by stealth. Don't be seduced by the notion uh, of private pay and giving you some kind of better choice or better care, because there's absolutely no evidence that that is the case. There's lots of evidence of the reverse. So I, it's in our all the interest of us all to do this. Mm -hmm. um, traditionally, uh, public policy in, in the health field centers on three things. Accessibility, and, and we have that in Canada for doctors and hospitals, we want more. Quality and cost effectiveness. On all three measures, the public system and the not-for-profit system work better than the for-profit system. Mm -hmm. And we could add a fourth criteria that is seldom mentioned, and that's democracy. Yeah. With a public system, we have a chance at least of making it a better system. So don't mourn, organize. And it's not equally accessible or necessarily equitable, but it's an awful lot better than the alternatives. And okay, actually, I had one last question. <laughs> what do you say? What do you say to the people who who say, "Oh, but we don't have the money. We don't have the resources." What do you say to those people? Well, Romano said, "It's a matter of values. It's, and it's, it's as, as sustainable as we want it to be. Mm. So it, it it depends on on us. Do you want cheap T-shirts or do you want good health care? You know." And, Leaving aside the, the issue that privatized care will be more expensive, uh, except for those who can't afford it then, and then they just die. You know, <laughs> recognizing that, that health care costs are the single biggest cause of bankruptcy in the United States ought to give people pause. <laughs> mm -hmm. And the, the number of people who don't get care is astounding. Yeah, I private drug insurance now when so many people are being laid off. Of course, the gig economy people never had um, uh, private health care uh, drug coverage as part of their jobs. But even those, those who did, who had so-called good jobs, to the extent they're laid off, they, they tend to lose their coverage. More so in the States, but also in Canada. Thank you guys both for all your work you've been doing and all your contributions. Thank well, you. thank you. We've enjoyed it. Sure.